everyone, I'm Kat and today I have for you a word in Romanian and also a Halloween true crime case. So let's get started with the word. The word for today is vampir. 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 Well done guys, you just said vampire. A sleepy village found itself to be the hunting ground of the vampire killer of Wales. A Welsh teenager was convinced that by drinking the blood of an elderly woman, he would become a vampire. What exactly did he do that night? How was he caught? And why would he believe that he could become a vampire? And who was his victim is what we are talking about today. When everything unfolded, Mabel Layson was a 90-year-old widow who lived alone in a bungalow on the Anglesey Island in Wales, in a village which has the longest name in Europe. I am not going to pretend that I can pronounce it, so I'm just going to be adding the pronunciation on here. We are looking at how to pronounce this very long name of a village in Wales. How do you go about pronouncing this? Let's give it a try. Chlanvar pof queen gich gogoth queen jobo chlan tisilio gogogoch. Did you get this? It's actually pretty straightforward once you know. Chlanvar pof queen gich gogoth queen jobo chlan tisilio gogogoch. Did you get this? Are you able to repeat this? Repeat after me. Your turn now. Mabel's husband, a former soldier, passed away 14 years before the tragic events of today's case. Mabel lived in the village for more than 30 years and she had previously been one of the teenager's customers when he was the local paperboy. Mabel was described by neighbors as a very private person who didn't really get involved in the local community. She kept to herself. One of her neighbors, Frank Jones, later told the BBC that he didn't even know her name was Mabel. That's how private she was. Mabel's cousin, Beatrice Williams, said that even though Mabel was physically weak due to her age, she was independent and had a keen and lively mind. Mabel would usually wake up at 7 a.m. and the first thing she would do in the mornings was to put lipstick on and she really liked having her hair done on a regular basis. At the time of our story, Matthew Hardman was a 17-year-old art and design student at Coleg Menai or Menai College in Bangor. Born in Amlik on the north coast of Anglesey, Matthew moved to this long name village which I will pronounce in a short way, Hlanvar, in 1998, aged 13 with his mother Julia, who was a nurse, and her partner Alan Bennyworth, a former Ministry of Defence fireman. Matthew's father died the same year, in 1998, from an asthma attack. Friends from college and from his former school, David House School, said that Matthew was normal. School teachers said that Matthew was a well-behaved boy, he had a good sense of humor, and even though he struggled academically because of his dyslexia, he was a very talented artist. According to his friends, though, his art portfolio was filled with morbid and depressing images, but it's very much possible that no one thought much of it. Matthew had completed one term of college and he had a part-time job as a kitchen porter at a local hotel. Matthew's family would say that he wasn't a weird guy, he didn't wear black, and he really wasn't like you would say the village's bad guy. He was just a normal kid who wore jeans and trainers. He liked video games, music, going drinking with his mates, and also had a real interest in art and design. However, he did have trouble with the law and some obsessive interests, which perhaps could have been a warning sign of what's next. Matthew had developed a fixation on vampires, to the point where he became convinced that the creatures existed in reality. He believed they drank human blood and believed that they could achieve immortality. On 23rd of September 2001, Matthew was arrested for assaulting a 16-year-old German exchange student. They were both in the girl's bedroom smoking 
is and chatting when the subject of vampires came up. Matthew said that Lanvar was the perfect spot for vampires, mostly because most of the residents there were elderly and it could be made to seem like the victims died of natural causes. Strangely, Matthew then went on to accuse the 16-year-old girl of being a vampire, even pushing his neck against her mouth and begging her to bite him so he can become a vampire as well. At first, the girl was thinking that it was kind of a joke, but obviously that she refused biting him. She began to scream when he then pinned her to the bed and again demanded that she bite him. The girl's landlady and an 18-year-old Chinese student who shared the accommodation, hearing the 16-year-old scream, rushed to help her only to find Matthew holding her down and saying, but she's a vampire. The Chinese student was really scared because he had an evil look in his eye and in a way she kind of felt responsible because she told him previously a lot of things about vampires. She witnessed Matthew shouting and acting like crazy. The 16-year-old girl looked quite scared and the 18-year-old tried to stop him, even slapping him on the face. But Matthew just wouldn't stop. He kept asking the 16-year-old to bite him and he didn't seem scared of anyone. The 18-year-old tried slapping him once again, but he wouldn't stop. He continued to shout, punching himself in the nose, hoping that the smell of blood would be irresistible to the vampire. He told the 16-year-old and the landlady to smell his blood. He wiped his face, wiped his nose and then raised his palm. This Chinese student was actually a friend of Matthew and she was the one who introduced him to her housemate, the 16-year-old German student. After this attack, the police were called and Matthew was arrested at 1.30 a.m. by Sergeant Peter Nicholson, who tried to speak to him and get him to live peacefully, but he didn't give any kind of logical response. All he said was, bite my neck. Matthew was taken handcuffed to the police station for breach of peace, but there were no charges brought. Matthew, however, claimed that he couldn't remember the attack. His use of having affected his memory. He even denied ever referring to killing elderly people. When he was told that he had said vampires normally killed old women, he replied, did I say that? That is news to me. On Saturday, November 24th, 2001, with his mother Julia and her partner Ellen away for the weekend under the influence of cannabis, Matthew broke into Mabel's bungalow. He threw a slate through the bottom glass panel of the back door and then crawled through it. He sneaked up on Mabel from behind. Being hard of hearing, Mabel wasn't able to hear him over the sound of the TV that she was watching in the front room. She struggled and put up a fight, but Matthew stabbed her 22 times with a knife he got from his own home. With gloves on, he then started setting up the scene and performing a ritual. He placed Mabel's body on an armchair with her legs propped up on a stool. He then placed two brass pokers on the floor below her feet in the form of an inverted cross. Two candlesticks were placed by her body and the red candle was placed on the mantelpiece. Matthew then sliced her chest open ripped out her heart, wrapped it in newspaper and placed it in a saucepan on top of a silver platter. Matthew had also made three deep gashes in the back of Maple's leg and drained the blood into the pan before drinking it as suggested by the lip marks found on the side of the pan. It was later claimed that Matthew took quite some time and possibly enjoyed doing this because the blood in the saucepan dried out before the newspaper with a heart in it was placed in the saucepan. Mabel's deceased body was found at lunchtime the following day on Sunday 25th of November 2001 by a Mills on Wheels volunteer who rang the police after noticing a broken window. At first, the police had no idea where to look for the murder suspect. This was a vicious and horrific attack and local residents were in a state of panic. Crime wasn't something usual in the area. There had only been one reported incident of burglary so far that year. 
at a news conference in Canavan on the following Tuesday, police appealed for any information of the driver of a blue transit van that was seen in Mabel's driveway the previous Wednesday. Inquiries were made into the movements of 37-year-old David Glyn Griffith, who came to the attention of police when he committed by setting himself on fire and jumping from the local Britannia Bridge on December the 4th. But his involvement was soon ruled out. A man who was seen hanging around outside Mabel's home on the afternoon of the incident was also eliminated. He actually came forward on December the 9th to tell police he was just waiting for a lift to go to work. There was also investigation into a possible link between Mabel's murder and that of 79-year-old Joanne Albert in Capel St. Mary is Ipswich. Joanne had also been stabbed repeatedly, but any connection was ruled out by December 19th. Police then made the decision to tell the media details of the crime. For example, the fact that Mabel's heart was removed and that more than 100 people had already given DNA samples for elimination purposes. On December 20th, a BBC Crime Watch reconstruction was aired in the hope of it leading to new leads. This was the first time Crime Watch made an appeal in Welsh. The aim of this appeal was to bring more attention from Anglesey, where over 90% of the residents are Welsh speakers. Detective Superintendent Alan Jones, who was leading the investigation, told the program, quote, the thoughts are his local, may well have a mental illness, is socially isolated and will have demonstrated some extremely strange behavior. End of quote. The Crime Watch appeal generated 200 phone calls. Following the appeal, the details of Matthew's earlier arrest were pointed out to investigating officers and the warrant was issued after Matthew's answers were inconsistent with an earlier statement. A search of his bedroom revealed his interest in vampires. He was found to have accessed websites such as the Vampire Rights Movement and the Vampire Donor Alliance. Matthew claimed he went on these websites just to have a look. He also had a copy of Bram Stoker's Dracula, a library book entitled The Devil, an autobiography, and two copies of Bizarre Magazine, which was a popular soft porn alternative lifestyle magazine, one of which included an article on how to perform a black mass. A black mass, if you are not aware, is essentially a ceremony typically celebrated by various satanic groups. It seems to have existed for centuries in different forms and is directly based on a Catholic mass. A black mass takes the Catholic mass and inverts it intentionally mocking the Catholic celebration. Participants often use a consecrated Eucharistic host and desecrate it, using it in obscene ways. Former Satanist Betty Brennan said in a talk that many Satanists and witches know the difference between a consecrated host and an unconsecrated host, being able to sense the presence of God in a consecrated host. She claims that if a thousand hosts were put on a table, the Satanist would be able to find the one that was consecrated. This would be in line with many passages in the Gospels where a person influenced by a demon knew that Jesus was the Messiah. A black mass will often include clerical clothing and the recital of Latin prayers, altering the Latin to be focused on Satan instead of God. Other rituals included in a black mass are sexual in nature and include various perverse sexual acts. The goal of a black mass is the exact opposite of a Catholic mass. Jesus established the Eucharistic celebration to strengthen our communion with God and other people, while the satanic mass creates division and confusion. Ever since his fall from heaven, Satan has been influencing humans in a negative way and tries to put a wedge between them and God. The Black Mass is one of the ultimate ways that Satan has devised to create in an individual a particular hatred of God, convincing them to desecrate a host that Catholics believe possess his real presence. This was used against Matthew Hardman in court, even though he claimed that his supposed obsession with vampires was only a subtle interest. Richard N. Cox's 
mentions the case in his 2007 book called Sil Serial Murder and the Psychology of Violent Crimes as evidence of how a weird hobby, in fact, proves very little and is comparable, for example, to the connection between high school shootings in the US with metal music. But there was more conclusive evidence against Matthew. DNA found at the murder scene matched blood found within a knife handle in the pocket of a coat in Matthew's bedroom. A pair of his Levi shoes, which had been recently cleaned, matched footprints at the scene. The trainers were a limited edition pair of trainers. Only a few pairs had been sold locally and when police held door-to-door -door inquiries they spotted Matthew wearing the same trainers. Some of his DNA was mixed with blood on the windowsill from which he left the house. The chance of the DNA belonging to someone else was said to be 1 in 73 million. When Matthew was arrested just before 8 a.m. on Tuesday, on Tuesday, January the 8th, 2002, DC Dewey Harding Jones said that Matthew turned around to his mother and said, don't worry, it's all right, mom, I didn't do anything. At 6.12 p.m. on Thursday, 10th of January, Detective Superintendent Ellen Jones stepped out from Canavan Police Station to announce that Matthew Hardman had been charged with murder. A judge at Canavan Court ordered ordered him to be remanded in custody until trial and he also placed a prohibition on his name being mentioned in the press. This was only lifted almost at the very end of his trial in August 2002. A team of 60 officers worked on this case, which was described at the time as the most callous and brutal North Wales police had ever seen. The five team leaders were presented with commendations for their professionalism and determination from North Wales Police Chief Constable Richard Brunstrom in May 2003. Held at Mould Crown Court, the 14-day trial was held over July and August 2002. Roger Thomas, Queen's Council, well, it's not Queen's Council anymore, it's King's Council now, for the prosecution argued that Matthew was obsessed with vampires. This was a murder carried out to satisfy his own sadistic and selfish ends. Roger Thomas, King's counsel, also said, quote, he may now deny it or seek to play it down, but we submit that in November 2001, he was fascinated by and believed in vampires. He believed they existed, believed they drank human blood, and believed, most importantly, that they could achieve immortality. These are not the views of a mentally unstable defendant. He is perfectly sane, and there is no medical issue whatsoever for you, the jury, to consider. There, end of quote. Matthew Hardman's defense barrister Robin Spencer King's counsel told the court that he was innocent. He claimed there was no conclusive evidence that the blood in the saucepan had been drunk and dismissed the link between the murder and the earlier assault on the German girl. The murder, according to him, was the work of a cold and calculating killer. However, the assault was sloppy, the result of someone out of control on this. Robin Spencer, King's, King's Council, said, quote, Is this 17-year-old dyslexic, somewhat naive young man who lacks self-assurance, the brutal, calculated, evil, cold-blooded killer the prosecution suggests he must be? End of quote. The defense barrister also revealed that other suspects, such as a man who was preoccupied with the occult and had once nailed a bird to a crucifix, had not been properly eliminated from inquiries. Matthew continued to insist he couldn't remember his whereabouts or actions. Child psychologist Gunnars Greenolds told the court that Matthew had a very poor concept of time and impaired short-term memory, which could explain his apparent confusion. Norma Jones, 64-year-old, said that she trusted Matthew completely, following decorating work he had carried out for her. She went on to say that he was a very hard worker, neat and tidy. However, this doesn't really mean that he wasn't capable of such a crime. Top forensic psychologist Ian Stephen told the BBC, quote, So many teenagers become obsessed with parts of culture like this young man. It's very difficult for parents to pick up these changes from normal interest to something that can become quite scary. If someone had ridiculed him, he may have needed to compensate for this. Something like vampirism 
may have given him what he was looking for, end of quote. Matthew Hardman claimed that at the time of the murder, he was with a Chinese student, remember the girl who slapped him to try and stop his assault on the German girl? However, his friend denied this, saying that he would have been at work at the time. Detective Sergeant Davis, Matthew's interviewing officer, said that despite his story's inconsistencies, he was cool, unfazed and fairly laid back, even though they questioned him in a number of interviews over a three-day period. Not only that, but when he was charged with the murder, he showed absolutely no emotion. At no stage during the interview did he even cry. Detective Sergeant Davis went on to say, quote, It is something that really brings it home to you. How a 17-year-old boy could be so cool, end of quote. In court, Matthew Hardman attempted to appear in the words of the son, cocksure and confident by answering the prosecution's questions with, I don't recall. However, his persistent hand wringing and facial twitch betrayed his nervousness. The jury made up of seven women and five men, deliberated for four hours before returning a unanimous guilty verdict. Mr. Justice Richards gave Matthew a life sentence stipulated, stipulating that he should serve a minimum of 12 years. He concluded, quote, I can make an allowance for a degree of confused thinking and immaturity for some childish fantasizing, but the fact remains this was an act of great wickedness and one that you have not faced up to and one for which you have not shown any remorse. Vampirism had indeed become a near obsession with you, that you really did believe that this myth may be true, that you did think that you would achieve immortality by the drinking of another person's blood and you found this an irresistible attraction." End of quote. Matthew tried to appeal the conviction. In August 2002, whilst detained at uh, AGM Prison Doncaster, his solicitor Michael Strain said, we believe there are grounds for appeal and papers will be lodged with the appeal court before Friday. A single judge will now consider whether there are sufficient grounds for appeal. We are hopeful that a hearing will be held before Christmas. If the judge agrees, he will grant Mr. Hardman legal aid and the matter will go to a full hearing in London. That hearing, if it goes ahead, could be held next spring. The application for appeal was turned down. In October 2003, Matthew's second attempt at being granted the right to appeal was also turned down. In spring 2004, a documentary, The Vampire, was broadcast on a Welsh language channel, S4C. It examined the possible influence of the vampire phenomenon in the media on Matthew's actions. Romanian academic and Count Dracula's only living relative, Constantin Bălăceanu Stolnic, told the program, quote, Dracula never drank blood. It's irresponsible of people in Britain to transfer responsibility for Mabel Layson's murder to my ancestor. This is not his responsibility because his behavior was not one of a Satanist, end of quote. And I have covered the story of Dracula and the real man behind it in one of my other videos. I am from Romania myself, so of course that this is very close to me. So you can, you know, check out the video that I did uh, last Halloween on Dracula uh, to find out to find out exactly who Dracula was, what he did, and why did he get the legend of drinking blood behind him. If you want to, you know, solve the mystery, of course, because. Truth be told, he wasn't a vampire and he wasn't drinking blood. He just got that uh, kind of story behind him because of the brutal ways that he would kill his enemies, like using a stake to put their heads on a stake so that the enemies would be scared of, you know, of him. But he was never someone who was a vampire or who drank blood. So anyway, if you want uh, to know more in depth about uh, Dracula and the real story behind the name and the uh, legend, then like I said, I already covered this in uh, my Halloween series from last year, so I'll leave the link somewhere here. And with this, we got to the end of the video, so please do let me know what do you guys think about this case. Have you heard of it? I think that uh, it's quite, uh, I think that at a time it was quite high profile, especially considering that, uh, you know, this guy, Matthew, he wanted to be a vampire. So yeah, please do let me know if you've heard of the case. For now, take care, stay safe, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!